Um, so we'll talk about drill, new drill technology. Um, so a lot of this application is for MIST lift, which for most minimally invasive surgeons, this is your workhorse operation still. Um, you know, if you look at um, you know market share utilization, it's still much a lot of posterior uh, T lift um, implants that are being used uh, out out in the out in the U.S. Um, so we'll discuss the application of DuraPro uh, for an MIST lift. Um, we'll go over the features of the oscillating drill. It's a little unique, uh, or actually quite unique in design. Uh, and then we'll do uh, discuss practical applications within the MIST lift. And so. Um, just as a refresher, I, I, Christoph just gave us a, a, a very elegant demonstration of TLIF approach. Uh, but just to kind of review from an anatomy standpoint, these are kind of the boundaries that you are uh, looking to resect when you're trying to approach the disk space. So um, when uh, when I like teach uh, MIS TLIF, I, I talk about it's really trans Cambin's triangle uh, interbody fusion. So as long as you understand the, the relationships of the boundaries as well as um, uh, where it is relative to the pedicle and the disc, um, you know, that's basically all you need to do to truly understand that procedure. Um, so this was a paper um, from uh, Mike and Lutumi Allen. Um, they talked about the original description of the space by Cambin. Um, it's not actually a triangle. This has actually been co-opted by a lot of uh, minimally invasive uh, talks, um, but there's a unnamed space in Kamen's triangle, and that's actually the superior articular process, which forms uh, sort of the roof. Um, and so the the the, um, uh, the the authors in this paper uh, wanted to liken this more to a prism as opposed to a triangle. And what you do with the superior articular process actually dictates how you can do. Uh, how you get to the disk base and different approaches, whether or not you, you want to do endoscopic or traditional MIST lift. So with the traditional MIST lift, you have an extended removal of the SAP, IAP, uh, maybe the lamina pars. This allows for decompression of the spinal canal. Um, there's some variations that exist where you leave uh, maybe the pars and lamina intact, or maybe um, you, know, you remove part of the SAP for an endoscopic type of approach. But this is kind of the traditional MIST lift. Uh, and then here on the schematic, you can see there's quite a few neural elements that are exposed and that are at play. Uh, you have your exiting nerve root, you have your traversing nerve root, uh, fecal sac. Uh, you know, these are all things that, um, you know, as spine surgeons, we, we're, we're, um, uh, we have to safeguard to, in order to adequately do our operation. Um, so that's where the DuraPro oscillating system comes in. So, for the most part, I mean, you can do that bony removal with osteotomes, things like that. But you know, a lot of people just use a high-speed burr, uh, and uh, it's especially interesting when you talk to trainees. They don't they don't think of they just kind of take it for granted. But uh, when the Midas first came out, you had to go do a course uh, down in Texas, um, you know, because it's it's actually a very dangerous tool. It r can rotate up to seventy-five thousand RPM, and uh, you have that in a human being, a live human being with nerves around it. So you know, there's a lot of you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of potential for harm if you're if you're not uh, careful here. Um, so with the DuraPro oscillating system, so instead of rotating uh, like a traditional burr, it actually oscillates. Um, and this uh, video here just demonstrates what uh, the differences are. So with a high-speed traditional burr, you have 360 rotation. So if you get any sort of soft tissue, it can get wrapped up, uh, and then you can imagine the fecal sac or a nerve root, something getting caught. And, and, uh, and a large laceration, and you know uh, maybe a nerve injury. Uh, but on the right, you can oops, uh, you can see the Dura Pro. You're on the Dura, and um, th this is actually um, a water-filled condom. And you can see you're you're on it, and you're not catching anything. So this is an add, added bit of insurance for when you're when you're doing these surgeries. Um, this video is from uh, a. A, uh, a pig model. Um, so this is a live pig, you know, animal surgery, and they're demonstrating here the drill actually being placed on the dura of the pig. So, and this is intentional. Um, so you wouldn't want to do this in a human, hence why this is a pig, you know. So, uh, but you know, the 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 uh, same principles apply here. So, you know, think about this if you're you're having a pork chop later, and so. Um, there are some differences in the handling characteristics of the drill because it's not 360 degrees. So this is just illustrating um, basically uh, you know, the, the cutting functions. It's still a side cutting 
uh, burr, um, there's those maybe 10 to 20 percent more manual force that you have to apply when you're making a cut. But essentially, you use it the same way as any sort of matchstick burr that we're used to. Um, and then so we're just talking about bone removal. So uh, once the SAP is removed and you have exposure of the disc, uh, the next thing is disc removal. So again, that's another thing where you're passing instruments in and out. Most of the instruments that you use to remove disc are, are pretty sharp and aggressive. Um, you know, if you're ever doing like an A-lift with uh, like a general surgeon for the first time and they see the instruments you have removed disc, it, it kind of freaks them out because you know, you're, you're sticking like a, a, a big cob or these you know, sharp curettes and you have all these vessels and, and vital structures around it. But that's, you know, as spine surgeons, that's kind of uh, par for the course. Um, and so maybe there's a safer way to do this uh, as well. So th this is um, just a photo taken from one of my MIST lifts. Uh, let's see if we can get the mouse pointer to work. Yeah. So just to orient, this is medial. Uh, this is going to be, uh, this will be rostral. And this is caudal. So the pedicle, that's a little bit of a lag here, sorry. So the pedicle's here, this white kind of pearly thing, that's the disc. Uh, but here you have the nerve, this is the exiting nerve root here, um, traveling, and then the traversing nerve root is here. So I've actually refined my technique where I'm, I'm really limited in how much exposure I have to the neural elements when I, um, when I do this. Um, you know, there's two, two things. One is it's safe, keeps me out of trouble, but on a second, um, uh, the second advantage is that I actually can let the residents do this earlier because if I'm not worried about them getting to a nerve or getting a leak, then I can just watch them do the drilling. And as long as we're kind of respecting the boundaries that uh, of just removing the SAP laterally, um, usually you can stay out of trouble. And you know, some other authors have described kind of this more limited approach to uh, a T lift. This is uh, from uh, Zach Ray's paper, where here he's just making enough of a channel through the facet where he can put his cage in. And um, the advantage of this is, again, you, you don't have to look at a nerve. You don't have to be worried about injuring a nerve. If you need to do a direct decompression later, you can always come back and do that later once the once your cage is in. Um, and actually, it makes it easier because if you're getting some reduction for a listhesis or you're getting some ligament to taxis from the height restoration of the disc that actually stretches things out and it makes your decompression easier as opposed to when it's, it's collapsed or listhese to, to begin with. Uh, but with this technology, uh, this is a disc brush that you can use to just, uh, it basically goes in, uh, you turn it on, and then um, the same oscillating feature here where uh, basically brushes the disc off. So uh, here you can see this cadaver where it basically creates this um, kind of a paste or a like a brulee type of uh, you know type um, consistency, and then it removes the disc. Um, and then to clean it, you don't want to put a sponge on it because it'll tear it up. You just put it in um, some irrigation, and you just turn it on, and it, it whips the di whips the disc fragments off uh, off the brush. Uh, so that's that's a that's a tool for for disc uh, removal. So. <laughs> Um, you know, with this sort of tool, you can just kind of brush around the margins of where you need to do for your disc prep, not have to worry about passing a curette um, or anything sharp in and out of Kamen's triangle. Does it create the same heat as a standard drill? Um, I believe so. I mean, I, I don't think it spins quite as fast. Uh, but yeah, anytime you have, um, you know, th th that sort of energy, it's going to create heat, right? Um, and especially if... You know, um, you know, as we all know, we, if your drills are getting a little bit old, they don't maintain the, the ball bearings or they start to, uh, you lose some of that friction, the, the handpiece itself can heat up. And, you know, I've had, uh, you know, heard of people getting burned from an actual drill because uh, it's not properly maintained. Um, and then the last feature here, um, I, I know this is not maybe germane to MIS surgery since, um, you know, you don't really create a pilot hole. You usually may be doing a Jamshidi or navigation. But if you have to create an open pilot hole, uh, there's this anti-skive tip uh, that can be used. And basically, uh, you can go um, you know, quite obliquely at a uh, vertical surface and not have to worry about skiving off. So uh, I think this has more of an application in robotics, where you know, that's probably the biggest enemy in terms of your accurate uh, screw placement in a robotic application is, is skiving, depending on what kind of anatomy you have to work with. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So, I mean, it's one thing to talk about a drill. I think it's 
probably better to illustrate in the lab, so hopefully we get enough time to, to, to put it through its paces, but I'll, I'll take any questions right now. I was just wondering, um, is there like a, a blade, is it only like a drill tip, or is it similar to Mysonics where you could do like an osteotome type cut? Uh, not like a blade um, type application. I, I think um, uh, I think I had the earlier slide of just current the 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 current tips available here. Yeah. So there's so at the top here you can see there's the kind of pilot hole maker. Then you have the brush. Then you have the kind of standard side cutting burr. Uh, and then there's like a larger kind of. Um, it's kind of like a diamond tip burr, so if you're going to do a corpectomy or something like that, it's a little bit more aggressive. Um, but nothing, nothing quite yet to do like an osteotomy. And um, so, yeah, uh, that's a great question. It sounds like, uh, or all the labels saying you can't navigate this, uh, which in some ways it's unfortunate. I, 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 I like to use navigated drills now. Um, right. Yeah, I think that may be more of a regulatory thing that needs to happen, but I'm sure that's in the, the pipeline, um, you know. But again, obviously, highly biased talk here, so. Uh, well, I, I mean, if you want to transition yeah. to lab, like, we could hopefully see what uh, you can show us. You know, Paul, you, you, you know, as Vic's getting ready, I, I was wondering, like, I'm interested, like, you know, I, I grew up, like, kerosening for the most part, and then uh, transitioned to just drilling with a Midas or a striker. Um, how many people use uh, ultrasonic scalpels? I, you know, Paul, Paul and I talked about it. I, I know you're a big fan of it. Uh, anybody else use something other than a drill? Anyone else use uh, ultrasonic, you know, bone cutting instruments? No? You do? Mom and Paul, I do. Sorry, Nima from San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Nima. I, like, I do use it. Yeah, what do you like using it for? Um, I actually, in the MIS context, I use it for the lateral retropleurals when I'm doing corpectomies or thoracic discrectomies. It helps a lot with uh, blood loss at a depth. Uh, you know, keep switching instruments between the drill where you're drilling out the cancellous bone, constantly bleeds, you have to put surgery foam and pad it with the ultrasonic technology it helps to coagulate as you cut um, so that that uh, kind of adds some uh, efficiency and uh, versatility to the procedure I, I think that's underappreciated when ultrasonic at least in my impression when ultrasonic bone cutting was introduced they didn't really play up the, uh, the decreased bleeding which I find it significant honestly uh, you know they were just talking about it being uh, fairly precise and it doesn't cut dura which it's mostly true, like anything else. Uh, but um, you could cut dura. I don't. You, this oscillating drill, I'm, I'm sure, could cut dura too if you push <laughs> hard I enough. Think, uh, Paul, I think with the with the ultrasonic technology, one of the key things is that because it heats up so much, which is where the coagulation comes from, if you stay stagnant, it could burn through the dura. And but, I've actually. Yeah, no, I. So you have to keep moving along with your right. trajectory. Yeah, you, you'll see if you use it in one area, it becomes dark. The heat yes, does build absolutely. up. And I, I came close to one just this week, you know, took the bone off, and there's like a dark line in the dura. I think if we stayed absolutely. any longer, it would have been a problem. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I think, um, you know, this goes to like surgeon health too. You know, kerosene is really bad for your hands, and like using all this, whether it's drilling or, or, um, ultrasonic scalpels and I, I think you kind of need both in some ways for a lot of procedures it, it they're good for certain aspects of it I can really you know maintain your uh, function as you get older um, so Mohammed I think you were going to comment on it as well yeah I think I use it for two main purposes uh, for my thoracic uh, decompressions you know sometimes it's you know you're, you feel a little bit nervous, you know, doing a lobster tail. I think this makes it very much easier. And then my partner, Dr. Deb Bomek, uh, I do my PSOs with him. He does his cuts using the ultrasonic, uh, and it decreases the blood loss by quite a lot. So, so really does, a good time. Yeah. So when you use it for, like, a, maybe Paul could comment. Um, you know, so the handle is not incredibly long sometimes. I mean, depending on body habitus and whatnot. But they have different attachments. Or do you use anything beyond the, you know, original 
you know, the scalpel attachments at all? Do you, I, I, know, I think Paul mentioned he used the side cutters and stuff like that as well, but. <clears throat> yeah, Mohammed, I think that's a really get a great application. They uh, made a 30 millimeter blade for a while for the PSO specifically because um, <clears throat> the 20 millimeter blades just really get to the front that easily, uh, but that one tended to break. Um, I actually, when I do a PSO, I like the macro shaver, so that was a, a cool video showing how the drill can potentially wrap up tissue. Mm -hmm. So when you're working around the pedicle, just getting it down to the stump of the body, that macro shaver, you know, you can use that, not worry about wrapping up the nerve root. <clears throat> if I use the drill, I'm tend, I tend to use two hands. So with the, with the macro shaver, you have a lot of control and you can use your sucker and the shaver at the same time. It really melts the bone away pretty efficiently. Yeah, yeah and I, I think, um, from a cost perspective, my impression is the Bisonics has come way down in, in pricing. It's not much more than a, it's maybe a little bit more than a drill tip. And, you know, it's a time savings if you ask me and I get, and again, I, I think the least, the less kerosening or manual labor you have to do with your hand, it, it's maybe worth the cost. So it's not, not extraordinary. Uh, so I, I don't know if Vic is ready in the lab. Maybe we could proceed to that. Can we transition the screen?